In Defense of Women by H. L. Mencken, Section 5, Marriage, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 21. The Effect on the Race it is, of course, not well for the world that the highest sort of men are thus selected out, as the biologists say, and that their superiority dies with them, whereas the ignoble tricks and sentimentalities of lesser men are infinitely propagated. Despite a popular delusion that the sons of great men are always dolts, the fact is that intellectual superiority is inheritable, quite as easily as bodily strength and that fact has been established beyond cavil by the laborious inquiries of Galton, Pearson, and the other anthropometricians of the English school. If such men as Spinoza, Kant, Schopenhauer, Spencer, and Nietzsche had married and begotten sons, those sons, it is probable, would have contributed as much to philosophy as the sons and grandsons of Weitbach contributed to music, or those of Erasmus Darwin to biology, or those of Henry Adams to politics, for those of Hamilcar Barca to the art of war. I have said that Herbert Spencer's escape from marriage facilitated his life work, and so served the immediate good of English philosophy. But in the long run it will work for a detriment, for he left no sons to carry on his labors, and the remaining Englishmen of his time were unable to supply the lack. His celibacy, indeed, made English philosophy coextensive with his life, since his death, the whole body of metaphysical speculation produced in England has been of little more practical value to the world than a drove of hogs. In precisely the same way, the celibacy of Schopenhauer, Kant, and Nietzsche has reduced German philosophy to feebleness. Even setting aside this direct influence of heredity, there is the equally potent influence of example and tuition. It is a gigantic advantage to live on intimate terms with the first-rate man, and have his care. Hamilcar not only gave Carthaginians a great general and his actual son, he also gave them a great general and his son-in-law, trained in his camp. But the tendency of first-rate men to remain a bachelor is very strong, and Sidney Lee once showed that, of all the great writers of England since the Renaissance, more than half were either celibate or lived apart from their wives. Even the married ones revealed the tendency plainly. For example, consider Shakespeare. He was forced into marriage while still a minor by the brothers of Anne Hathaway, who was several years his senior, and had debauched him and gave out that she was enciente by him. He escaped from her abhorrent embraces as quickly as possible, and thereafter kept as far away from her as he could. His very distaste for marriage, indeed, was the cause of his residence in London, and hence in all probability, of the labors which made him immortal. In different parts of the world, various expedients have been resorted to to overcome this reluctance to marriage among the better sort of men. Christianity in general combats it on the ground that it is offensive to God, though at the same time leaning towards an enforced celibacy among its own agents. This discrepancy is fatal to the position. On the one hand, it is impossible to believe that the same God who permitted his own son to die a bachelor regards celibacy as an actual sin. And on the other hand, it is obvious that the average cleric would be damaged but little, and probably improved appreciably, by having a wife to think for him, and to force him to virtue and industry, and to aid him otherwise in his sordid profession. Where religious superstitions have died out, the institution of the dot prevails, an idea borrowed by Christians from the Jews. The dot is simply a bribe designed to overcome the disinclination of the male. It involves a frank recognition of the fact that he loses by marriage, and it seeks to make up for that lost by a money payment. Its obvious effect is to give young women a wider and better choice of husbands. A relatively superior man, otherwise quite out of reach, may be brought into camp by the assurance of economic ease, and what is more, he may be kept in order after he has been taken by the consciousness of his gain. Among hard-headed and highly practical people, such as Jews and the French, the dot flourishes, and its effect is to promote intellectual suppleness in the race, 
for the average child is thus not inevitably the offspring of a woman and a noodle, as with us, but may be the offspring of a woman and a man of reasonable intelligence. But even in France the very highest class of men tend to evade marriage. They resist money almost as unanimously as their Anglo-Saxon brethren resist sentimentality. In America the dot is almost unknown, partly because money-getting is easier to men than in Europe and is regarded as less degrading, and partly because American men are more naive than French men and are thus readily intrigued without actual bribery. But the best of them nevertheless lean to celibacy, and plans for overcoming their habit are frequently proposed and discussed. One such plan involves a heavy tax on bachelors. The defect in it lies in the fact that the average bachelor, for obvious reasons, is relatively well-to-do, and would pay the tax rather than marry. Moreover, the payment of it would help to salve his own conscience, which is now made restive, I believe, by a maudling feeling that he is shirking his duty to the race, and so he would be confirmed and supported in his determination to avoid the altar. Still further, he would escape the social odium which now attaches to his celibacy, for whatever a man pays for is regarded as his right. As things stand, that odium is of definite potency, and undoubtedly has its influence upon a certain number of men in the lower ranks of bachelors. They stand, so to speak, in the twilight zone of bachelorhood, with one leg furtively over the altar rail. It needs only an extra pull to bring them to the sacrifice. But if they could compound for their immunity by a cash indemnity, it is highly probable that they would take on a new resolution, and in the end they would convert what remained of their present disrepute into a source of egoistic satisfaction, as is done indeed by a great many bachelors even today. These last immoralists are privy to the elements which enter into that disrepute, the ire of women whose devices they have resisted, and the envy of men who have succumbed. 22. Compulsory Marriage I myself once proposed an alternative scheme, to wit, the prohibition of sentimental marriages by law and the substitution of matchmaking by the common hangman. This plan, as revolutionary as it may seem, would have several plain advantages. For one thing, it would purge the serious business of marriage of the romantic falderall that now corrupts it, and so make for the peace and happiness of the race. For another thing, it would work against the process which now selects out, as I have said, those men who are most fit and so throws the chief burden of paternity upon the inferior to the damage of posterity. The hangman, if he made his selections arbitrarily, would try to give his office permanence and dignity by choosing men whose marriage would meet with public approbation, that is, men obviously of sound stock and talents, that is, the sort of men who now habitually escape. And if he made his selection by the hazard of the die, or by drawing numbers out of a hat or by any other such method of pure chance, that pure chance would fall indiscriminately upon all orders of men, and the upper orders would thus lose their present comparative immunity. True enough, a good many men would endeavor to influence him privately to their own advantage, and it is probable that he would occasionally succumb. But it must be plain that the men most likely to prevail in that enterprise would not be philosophers, but politicians, and so there would be some benefit to the race even here. Posterity surely suffers no very heavy loss when a congressman, a member of the House of Lords, or even an ambassador or prime minister dies childless. But when a Herbert Spencer goes to the grave without leaving sons behind him, there is a detriment to all the generations of the future. I did not offer the plan, of course, as a contribution to practical politics, but merely as a sort of hypothesis to help clarify the problem. Many other theoretical advantages appear in it, but its execution is made impossible, not only by their inherent defects, but also by a general disinclination to abandon the present system which at least offers certain attractions to concrete men and women, despite its unfavorable effects upon the unborn. Women would oppose the substitution of chance or arbitrary fiat for the existing struggle, for the plain reason that every woman is convinced, and no doubt rightly, 
that her own judgment is superior to that of either the common hangman or the gods, and that her own enterprise is more favorable to her opportunities. And men would oppose it, because it would restrict their liberty. Their liberty, of course, is largely imaginary. In its common manifestation, it is no more at bottom than the privilege of being bamboozled and made a mock of by the first woman who ventures to essay the business. But nonetheless, it is quite as precious to men as any other of the ghosts that their vanity conjures up for their enchantment. They cherish the notion that unconditioned volition enters into the matter, and that under volition there is not only a high degree of sagacity, but also a touch of the daring and the devilish. A man is often almost as much pleased and flattered by his own marriage as he would be by the achievement of what is currently called a seduction. In the one case, as in the other, his emotion is one of triumph. The substitution of pure chance would take away that soothing unction. The present system, to be sure, also involves chance. Every man realizes it, and even the most bombastic bachelor has moments in which he humbly whispers, there, but for the grace of God, go I. But that chance has a sugar-coating. It is swathed in egoistic illusion. It shows less stark and intolerable chanciness, so to speak, than the bald hazard of the die. Thus men prefer it, and shrink from the other. In the same way, I have no doubt, the majority of foxes would object to choosing lots to determine the victim of a projected fox-hunt. They prefer to take their chances with the dogs. 23. Extra-Legal Devices It is, of course, a rhetorical exaggeration to say that all first-class men escape marriage, and even more of an exaggeration to say that their high qualities go wholly untransmitted to posterity. On the one hand, it must be obvious that an appreciable number of them, perhaps by reason of their very detachment and preoccupation, are intrigued into the holy estate and that not a few of them entered deliberately, convinced that it is safe as formally as on possible under Christianity. And, on the other hand, one must not forget the biological fact that it is quite feasible to achieve offspring without the imprimatur of church and state. The thing indeed is so commonplace that I need not risk a scandal by uncovering it in detail. What I allude to, I need not add, is not that form of irregularity which curses innocent children with the stigma of illegitimacy, but that more refined and thoughtful form which safeguards their social dignity while protecting them against inheritance from their legal fathers. English philosophy, as I have shown, suffers by the fact that Herbert Spencer was too busy to permit himself any such romantic altruism, just as American literature gains enormously by the fact that Walt Whitman adventured, leaving seven sons behind him, three of whom are now well-known American poets and in the forefront of the new poetry movement. The extent of this correction of a salient evil of monogamy is very considerable. Its operations explain the private disrepute of perhaps a majority of first-rate men. Its advantages have been set forth in George Moore's, quote, Euphorion in Texas, end quote, though in a clumsy and sentimental way. What is behind it is the profound race sense of women, the instinct which makes them regard the unborn in their every act, perhaps, too, the fact that the interests of the unborn are here identical, as in other situations, with their own egoistic aspirations. As the popular philosophy has shrewdly observed, the objections to polygamy do not come from women, for the average woman is sensible enough to prefer half or a quarter or even a tenth of a first-rate man to the whole devotion of a third-rate man, Considerations of much the same sort also justify polyandry, if not morally, then at least biologically. The average woman, as I have shown, must inevitably view her actual husband with a certain disdain. He is anything but her ideal. In consequence, she cannot help feeling that her children are cruelly handicapped by the fact that he is their father, nor can she help feeling guilty about it for she knows that he is their father only by reason of her own initiative in the proceedings anterior to her marriage. If, now, an opportunity presents itself to remove that handicap from at least some of them, and at the same time to realize her ideal and satisfy her vanity, if such a chance offers, it is no wonder that she occasionally embraces it. Here we have an explanation of many lamentable and otherwise inexplicable violations of domestic integrity. 
the woman in the case is commonly dismissed as vicious, but that is no more than a new example of the common human tendency to attach the concept of viciousness to whatever is natural and intelligent, and above the comprehension of politicians, theologians, and greengrocers. 24. Intermezzo on Monogamy The prevalence of monogamy in Christendom is commonly ascribed to ethical motives. This is quite as absurd as ascribing wars to ethical motives, which, of course, is frequently done. The simple truth is that ethical motives are no more than deductions from experience, and that they are quickly abandoned whenever experience turns against them. In the present case, experience is still overwhelming on the side of monogamy. Civilized men are in favor of it because they find that it works. And why does it work? Because it is the most effective of all available antidotes to the alarms and terrors of passion. Monogamy, in brief, kills passion. And passion is the most dangerous of all the surviving enemies to what we call civilization, which is based upon order, decorum, restraint, formality, industry, regimentation. The civilized man, the ideal civilized man, is simply one who never sacrifices the common security to his private passions. He reaches perfection when he even ceases to love passionately, when he reduces the most profound of all of his instinctive experiences from the level of an ecstasy to the level of a mere device for replenishing the armies and workshops of the world, keeping clothes in repair, reducing the infant death rate, providing enough tenants for every landlord, and making it possible for the polsey eye to know where every citizen is at every hour of the day or night. Monogamy accomplishes this not by producing satiety, but by destroying appetite. It makes passion formal and uninspiring, and so gradually kills it. The advocates of monogamy, deceived by its moral overtones, fail to get all the advantage out of it that is in it. Consider, for example, the important moral business of safeguarding the virtue of the unmarried, that is, of the still passionate. The present plan in dealing, say, with a young man of twenty, is to surround him with scarecrows and prohibitions, to try and convince him logically that passion is dangerous. This is both supererogation and imbecility. Supererogation because he already knows that it is dangerous, and imbecility because it is quite impossible to kill a passion by arguing against it. The way to kill it is to give it rain under unfavorable and dispiriting conditions, to bring it down by slow stages to the estate of an absurdity and a an horror. How much more, then, could be accomplished if the wild young man were forbidden polygamy before marriage, but permitted monogamy? The prohibition in this case would be relatively easy to enforce, instead of impossible as in the other. Curiosity would be satisfied, nature would get out of her cage, even romance would get an inning. Ninety-nine young men out of a hundred would submit, if only because it would be much easier to submit than to resist. And the result? Obviously it would be laudable, that is, accepting current definitions of the laudable. The product after six months would be a well-regimented and disillusioned young man, as devoid of disquieting and demoralizing passion as an ancient of eighty, in brief, the ideal citizen of Christendom. The present plan surely failed to produce the satisfactory crop of such ideal citizens. On the one hand, its impossible prohibitions called a multitude of lamentable revolts, often ending in a silly sort of running amuck. On the other hand, they fill the YMCAs with scared poltroons full of indescribably disgusting Freudian suppressions. Neither group supplies many ideal citizens. Neither promotes the sort of public morality that it is aimed at. 25. Late Marriages The marriage of a first-rate man when it takes place at all commonly takes place relatively late. He may succumb in the end, but he is almost always able to postpone the disaster a good deal longer than the average poor clodpate or normal man. If he actually marries early, it is nearly always proof that some intolerable external pressure has been applied to him, as in Shakespeare's case or that his mental sensitiveness approaches downright insanity, as in Shelley's. This fact, curiously enough, has escaped the observation of an otherwise extremely astute observer, namely Havelock Ellis. 
In his study of British genius, he notes the fact that most men of unusual capacities are the sons of relatively old fathers. But instead of exhibiting the true cause thereof, he ascribes it to a mysterious quality whereby a man already in decline is capable of begetting better offspring than one in full vigor. This is a palpable absurdity, not only because it goes counter to facts long established by animal breeders, but also because it tacitly assumes that talent, and hence the capacity for transmitting it, is an acquired character and that this character may be transmitted. Nothing can be more unsound. Talent is not an acquired character, but a congenital character, and the man who is born with it has it in early life quite as well as in later life, though its manifestation may have to wait. James Mill was yet a young man when his son, John Stuart Mill, was born, and not one of his principal books had been written. But though the elements of political economy and the analysis of the human mind were thus but vaguely formulated in his mind, if they were actually so much as formulated at all, it was fifteen years before he wrote them, he was still quite able to transmit the capacity to write them to his son. And that capacity showed itself years afterwards in the latter's Principles of Political Economy and essay on liberty. But Ellis's faulty inference is still based upon a sound observation, to wit, that the sort of man capable of transmitting high talents to his son is ordinarily a man who does not have a son at all, at least in wedlock, until he advanced into middle life. The reasons which impel him to yield even then are somewhat obscure, but two or three of them perhaps may be vaguely discerned. One lies in the fact that every man, whether of the first class or of any other class, tends to decline in mental agility as he grows older, though in the actual range and profundity of his intelligence he may keep on improving until he collapses into senility. Obviously, it is mere agility of mind and not profundity that is of most value and effect in so tricky and deceptive a combat as the duel of sex. The aging man, with his agility gradually withering, is thus confronted by a woman in whom it still luxuriates as a function of their relative youth. Not only do women of his own age aspire to ensnare him, but also women of all ages back to adolescence. Hence his average or typical opponent tends to be progressively younger and younger than he is, and in the end the mere advantage of her youth may be sufficient to tip over in his tottering defenses. This, I take it, is why oldish men are so often intrigued by girls in their teens. It is not that age caused maudlinly to youth, as the poets would have of it. It is that age is no match for youth, especially when age is male and youth is female. The case of the late Heinrich Ibsen was typical. At forty, Ibsen was a sedate family man, and it is doubtful that he ever so much as glanced at a woman. All his thoughts were upon the composition of The League of Youth, his first social drama. At fifty, he was almost as preoccupied. A doll's house was then hatching. But at sixty, with his best work all done, his decline begun, he succumbed preposterously to a flirtatious damsel of eighteen. And thereafter, until actual insanity released him, he mooned like a provincial actor in a sentimental melodrama. Had it not been, indeed, for the fact that he was already married, and to a very sensible wife, he would have run off with this flapper and so made himself publicly ridiculous. Another reason for the relatively late marriages of superior men is found, perhaps, in the fact that, as a man grows older, the disabilities he suffers by marriage tend to diminish and the advantages to increase. At thirty, a man is terrified by the inhibitions of monogamy, and his little taste for the so-called comforts of a home. At sixty, he is beyond amorous adventure and is in need of creature ease and security. What he is oftenest conscious of in these later years is his physical decay. He sees himself as an imminent danger of falling into neglect and helplessness. He is thus confronted by a choice between getting a wife or hiring a nurse, and he commonly chooses the wife as the less expensive and exacting. The nurse, indeed, would probably try to marry him anyhow. If he employs her in place of a wife, he commonly ends by finding himself married, and minus a nurse, to his confusion and discomfiture, and to the far greater discomfiture of his heirs and his signs. This process is so obvious and so commonplace that I apologize formally for rehearsing it. What it indicates is simply this, 
that a man's instinctive aversion to marriage is grounded upon a sense of social and economic self-sufficiency, and that it descends into a mere theory when this self-sufficiency disappears. After all, nature is on the side of mating, and hence on the side of marriage, and vanity is a powerful ally of nature. If men, at the normal mating age, had half as much to gain by marriage as women gain, then all men would be as ardently in favor of it as women are. End of Section 5, Marriage Part 2